Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you can see the screen as well. Right, so I would like to disclose, give a disclosure that I'm not an expert, but I'm still working on myself. And throughout my journey, I've gathered a lot of information. And today I would like to share that information with you. So the idea here is that self-specialty fellowships, like after completing your ophthalmology residency, people can still opt for a career pathway in the US if they don't want to opt for the traditional residency pathway. This includes those who have not done a US residency, of course, and those even those who do not have US MLEs. So this is a new concept, which I also recently found out in my extensive journey. And I will be giving an overview of uh, how it works. And I will also mention the traditional pathway of getting a residency in the US. So the idea here is that there are different kinds of fellowship models, uh, not just in the US, but across the world. Residency is very structured through a curriculum with license and lots of other supervision requirements. But fellowships are slightly, uh, they have different models. They can be quite flexible. They have different licensing requirements and different visa requirements. There are different categories. They can be a pre-residency research workshop, a research fellowship, or even a post-residency fellowship. Um, it has a different value upon completion. Some of them have only some uh, symbolic international significance like research. Others lead to a US license. Some of them are ACDME accredited, others are non-ACDME accredited. They may or may not lead to board certification. And then there are lots of requirements for board certification, which is the eventual goal for anyone uh, who wants to practice in the US. So all of these information, the resources you can get from different networking events, from different subspecialty societies like American Academy, OSP, AUPO, NANOS. I will tell you a little bit about them as, as well. There are other subspecialty conferences like NEOS conference I attended, American Academy conference, ARVO, ICOs. So anyone who wants to get into the US system has to be very familiar with all of these societies and conferences. Then you can have alumni networks if you have one. Uh, there's also published literature on this pathway as well. You can also see YouTube videos and you know, specifically you, at the end of the day, you need to visit the university website, department website for the uh, applications. Uh, lots of institutional resources and other things are out there, which some of them we'll talk about. This is one example of our um, AKU alumni network so they help us connect with other individuals. And this is only for AKU, but um, otherwise I'll show you other resources as well. So this is an example of our ophthalmology interest group of medical students where uh, we, again, we try to bridge the gap between students and alumni and faculty for them to create a path for themselves. So coming on towards the public resources, um, I will again uh, share my screen and show you that this is American Academy of Ophthalmology website global training opportunities for uh, residents across the world. So if you go to this website, you will see that it gives you a region throughout the world, anywhere. You can collect uh, US, Canada, India, Pakistan. This is a global directory, right? So no, no strict limitations. Country, whichever country you want, all the ophthalmologists together providing the fellowship opportunities here. So specifically for the US, as I mentioned, the different types of fellowships, they can be clinical, they can be research, they can be surgical, non-surgical. Patient care depends on your credentials. You can have direct clinical patient care, direct surgical patient care, no patient care, observational patient care. Uh, financial support, again, variable with, without. So you see the idea is fellowships are somewhat flexible Based on your credential, you will get it. That's one aspect. The other aspect is what do you want to achieve by going to the US? Do you want to go as an immigrant? Do you want to go with a full license? Or do you want to go as a trainee and get your training fellowship and then come back to serve your home country? So all of these different models provide different opportunities to you. So you need to make a very clear decision on what you want. So on this website, I would like to show you quickly, if you go to, for example, any of these institutes, as you can see, 860 results. These are, I think, all across the world. So again, you need to click. Uh, for some reason, the, the filter was not working yesterday when I tried as well. But the idea here is 
you see Ali Crest Eye Hospital in Pakistan. It's also registered there. Let's take this example. Uh, Northwestern Medicine Department of Ophthalmology. It's a good university program. So you click on it. So it gives you all the resources that you require. It's university. This is the website. You need to click on the website. Okay. Just uh, mute everyone. Okay. So you can see here, it gives you the the website. So this is Northwestern Medicine website is available here. Um, again, you want to look at the residents. You can get information on the residents. You want to look at the fellows. You get information on the fellowship program. Uh, today's audience is basically uh, residents. So we would have completed our residency here. So I would go for the fellowships. These are all the fellowships being offered by them. Again, standard ophthalmology uh, fellowships, cornea, glaucoma, medical retina, pediatric ophthalmology, uveitis, vitro retina. You go on each of these programs, you read them out, and you find what are the requirements. So you go here, you look around, you see that it is AUPU accredited. Application deadline is this date. Applicants from outside the US must have passed USMLE examination and be able to secure an Illinois state medical license. So if you're given your uh, USMLEs, uh, you also need the state license. So we'll come to that. But you see, you need to be familiar with all of these departments and all of their websites and each of their programs and then make a decision that, okay, I would like to apply for this post right over here. And I will tell you more about it later on. So this was just an orientation of how you want to uh, get oriented. So this was one resource we started from um, American Academy website, right? So it's available there, look it up, go through everything in detail and you will find something uh, worth exploring. So other things I would like to share here are, this, this was another thing which I came across. Uh, I would like to play this small video and you'll all get the idea. Right. So this is a complete video available on YouTube. You can look at the whole path here. What I wanted to highlight here was this person has given a very good uh, detailed information on this alternate entry pathway. This is a board which he highlighted. Right. So again, all of this material available on YouTube, definitely go through it. And this is something which uh, I will be discussing today as well. So this is for um, anesthesiology, right? 
So we have a similar pathway for ophthalmology. Again, if you want to go with USMLEs, you can apply for clinical fellowships. If you go without USMLEs, then you have to apply for research fellowships or a supervised license. So that's how it works. But the basis is if, like someone has asked, uh, our FCPS is not recognized. It is recognized in the sense that you need to have completed a home country residency and then you start to uh, follow these alternate pathways. So you, de you do need FCPS, which is not recognized for the license, but for this kind of a clinical fellowship post, the university will recognize most of the uh, degrees from outside. So moving on towards another very important aspect, this is AUPO website. So AUPO yeah. is uh, the authoritative body which, uh, which organizes, manages, accredits the ophthalmology fellowships. American University of Professor Ophthalmology, I think it stands for that. And again, you go on this website, you look how the application process is, you look at all the options you have, cornea, glaucoma, medical retina, neuro-ophthalmology. Another very important thing I would like to highlight here is, um, overall, globally, we know that the top choices for ophthalmologists are surgical retina or glaucoma or cornea. That means that all the US residency uh, graduates would also like to apply for surgical retina, medical cornea, or glaucoma. Uh, what does that mean? That means there's a decreased number of applicants in neuro-ophthalmology, in peds ophthalmology, ubiitis, these kinds of topics. This is very important to know, especially as an international applicant, you need to know where your standing is. If you look into the surgical retina, the requirements, there are very strict requirements. You need an American residency, you need the license, you need everything required to get a proper surgical retina fellowship. But here again, if you look at neuro ophthalmology, and if you go through all of this text, then you will realize that a lot of these are open without USMLEs even, but eventually you might need USMLEs. A lot of these are uh, training for training purposes for globally. And you will see a very supportive, um, supportive you know, attitude of neuro-ophthalmologists and pre ophthalmologists towards international applicants. So this is something very important to know that if you want a proper license or if you want a good smooth pathway into US, uh, neuro-ophthalmology and pre ophthalmology are the way to go. So moving on, I would like to share a few more online resources here. So this is the SF match. SF match stands for San Francisco match. And again, this is the fellowship, uh, the, the platform for putting forward your applications. You can look at the statistics here, which mention that this, this many applicants were there in 2002, 2017 to 2022. These many seats were there, these many programs were there. And then it shows um, how many positions were filled and how many vacancies were there, right? So you see, at the end of the day, there are lots of vacancies out there in the US, which they would like to fill with any international applicant or any you know, competent individual who fulfills their criteria. So all of this is helpful. All of this is available on SF Match. And if we further look into these websites, now, what I, what I did here was I clicked on vacancies. If you click here on vacancies, then you will realize in the last year's match, this hospital, this place had a vacancy which was not filled. This hospital, this place had a vacancy which was not filled. And this is for ophthalmology because I put in the filter here, ophthalmology, right? Uh, let me just put it again. Ophthalmology fellowship. Uh, Wills Eye Hospital, Ocular Oncology. Global Ophthalmology, Mori. Wilma Institute, Glaucoma, UCLA, PD ophthalmology, PD ophthalmology, UVITIS, PD ophthalmology, PD ophthalmology, UVITIS. So you see a trend here. PD ophthalmology, UVITIS, um, neuro ophthalmology, these are relatively easier to get. So again, what you need to do is you click on this complete description, you read it up, you find their eligibility. So every institute, every program has their own eligibility requirement. Majority of them, will need a US residency. But 
If you go through all of them systematically, you will find that there are a lot of options here which do not require US residency, which may or may not require, sorry, so which may or may not require, um, I mean, there are lots of, everyone has their own conditions, so you need to go through them. And again, all of these websites I mentioned here, you click on the website, you click on the program, you click on the website, you click on the program. It's an extensive process, but obviously this is the way to go. So this is another resource, pre agency fellowship programs, non-traditional. Again, West Coast region, ophthalmic pathology, glaucoma, low vision, ophthalmic pathology, uh, ophthalmic imaging, quality improvements, ophthalmic pathology, research, OCT, lots of fellowships opportunities there. So moving on, I would like to give you a few case examples here. There are a few individuals which I've known over the years who have uh, given their, who have practiced in the US with or without, I will tell you the conditions. So Dr. Abdul Sami Yemen, he's my program director and uh, he got a fellowship from UC Irvine in California. Uh, he had limited license under supervision. He was on a J1 visa. He did two years of research and clinical uh, fellowship in medical retina. And he also went for an ICO fellowship in the US. He did not get a full license because he did not want to pursue it further. So he came back, but then these were his credentials. And you can see he went there without USMLE. So two year fellowship in UC Irvine okay. without USMLE. It was a good experience for him. He learned a lot and he came back. And um, then I know another IMG from Lahore. He also did not give it his USMLEs. He did a six month fellowship in University of Utah, which was a clinical uh, clinical fellowship and on uveitis on a B1 visa. Again, he opted to come back. If he had wanted to stay there, he would need to fulfill the licensing requirements of USMLEs. And this is another example of an Egyptian I met. He also did not give his USMLEs and he was doing a fellowship in retina. Uh, this is one of the highest, best examples that I can quote here of Dr. Professor Muin uh, with his uh, permission. So he gave his step one and two. He did his fellowship from inocular plastics in University of Cincinnati. It was a hand-on surgical fellowship uh, on a J1 visa. And um, so he gave um, good advice here as well, which you can read out. He applied to a lot of programs and he said, it's good if you need to decide if you want to settle there or if you want to come back. If you want to come back, you don't need to go through all of the steps. But if you want to settle there, eventually at some point you will need to give steps. So then again, I mentioned uh, these are all copied from that same uh, website where I showed you. And all of these resources are again available. Uh, this was University of Utah. Just Google it up and it will come. So shifting gears towards uh, residency. Uh, I, would, I would quickly mention this because we are already residents and I personally do not want to do a residency again in the US. But for medical students out there who wish to give a residency, I'll quickly mention a few resources. So this was a very good resource. It's a YouTube video. Again, mention all the details of how to apply, what are your chances, uh, what I need to do. This many international applicants have applied in this year and this many have matched. And all of those details, which all those USMLE people are very familiar with. This is the average score. This was another excellent article published in Ophthalmology Journal by American Academy of Ophthalmology, predictors of matching in ophthalmology residency program. And you can read up this article, look it up. It has a lot of detail and some of that detail I mentioned here. So this article mentions what you need to do is you need to get three LORs from US based ophthalmologists. It increases your chances of matching six fold. You need to publish research in high impact journals. This increases your chances of matching three fold in residency. You need to hire your assembly scores increases order matching threefold. You need to get US experience matching threefold. And then in that same article, they mentioned what are the negative points. So if applying for a residency, if someone has postgraduate training, then the chances were slightly decreased, reduces the odd. So how can you get letters of recommendation? It's the first step. 
uh, get your electives. This increases your chances of matching six four. Again, electives, research experience, experience, research fellowship. Uh, how do you publish in high impact journals? You explore the whole uh, world of publications. How many resources? This article mentioned you need only one, but with an impact factor of more than three, which is quite difficult. What are the scores required? Uh, step one is now pass fail. Step two uh, score is important. Step three score is also important. And this was a table taken from that article. Um, a few agency case examples I'll quickly mention. Uh, with his permission, uh, Dr. Hassan is uh, doing his residency in Stanford University. He gave his steps. He has a full license. He did uh, three, uh, quite a few years of research before getting uh, his residency. And then here is another example. Another AQU graduate, he also went through the whole traditional pathway, electives, research, steps, all of that, and then he finally found his residency. And again, even for medical students, these specific fellowships are open uh, as pre-residency fellowships, as research fellowships, before joining a formal residency program. So as, as uh, graduates of residencies programs, we can also opt for these fellowships. As medical students, we can also opt for these fellowships. So all of this is definitely doable, but you need lots of information. You need to make a decision. You need to connect with the right people. You need to work hard on steps, work hard on research. There is no shortcut here. Uh, for fellowship, you need to decide if you want to stay there or you want to come home. And it is definitely difficult, but uh, ophthalmology is uh, definitely worth it in the US. And finally, if I'm not missing anything, this is a website, uh, North American Neuro Ophthalmology Society, NANOS. Again, it has lots of fellowship opportunities. You need to go through all of these websites one by one. Um, this was a table I found here. Again, where are all these opportunities? So you, as you go through them, you will find out, for example, this is AUPO compliant programs. You click on them, it gives you a whole list of programs. And here a very specific question is mentioned. Does the program accept international fellows? We have your answer. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, yes, no. Must be CFM certified. Yes, no, must have these requirements, must have these requirements. Does the program accept uh, these cases? How many posts are offered? If you have any further questions, you are open to emailing them. Uh, do you offer surgical training? Yes, no, yes, no. So again, a huge resource taken from the website, available oh. there. Then you have non-AUPO compliant programs, which are not fully accredited. And then they would have even lesser requirements. So you need to go through all of this. And finally, uh, after you do a certain years of practice in the US, then you will it will be time for you to become board certified. And this is a, a new pathway which they opened up, internationally trained ophthalmologists pathway on the American board website. Go through this, it has lots of eligibility requirements. So five years full licensing in the US will make you board eligible. You will also need ECMD certificate, which is um, after USMEDs. Again, go through all of this requirement, fill the application form, and then eventually you will be board certified. I know people who have gone through these pathways who are fully board certified in the US practicing, and you can look them up in the websites as well. We did a residency in home country, but they are fully board certified. Um, so yeah, it's a difficult pathway, challenging, but um, as they say, well, there's a will, there's a way. And uh, the idea here was if just to improve your own quality of ophthalmology, you can go get a good quality research program, um, learn about stuff, how stuff works in the US, and then come back with that specialty. Uh, for example, um, uh, even in Pakistan, we, we don't have lots of neuro ophthalmologists. We don't have specific field ophthalmologists. We don't have ugaita specialists. We don't have ocular genetics specialists. These fellowships you can get easily in the US. You can uh, either come back to Pakistan, you can opt for Middle East. Um, lots of opportunities open up, but you need to make a decision on your uh, specific field as well. So if you have any questions, you can quickly uh, take any questions.
And I think we have five, six minutes remaining here. And sorry, close the gate. So uh, is it possible to get clinical fellowship based on just step one? There are very few limited numbers of clinical fellowships without USMLEs and um, depending on the you know specialty. So if you're saying I want a fellowship in ocular pathology, yes, you will get it without USMLEs because no patient interaction. If you're in ocular pathology, you will get a clinical fellowship in, for example, maybe in pediatric ophthalmology or neuro ophthalmology or very ocular genetics, you will get a clinical fellowship. So yes, in, in those specific criteria, you might get one uh, without steps. But as you come into patient interaction, you need to have good credentials. Uh, Dr. Bilal, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Bilal, like, uh, like in the UK, in Australia, in Australia, in Australia, in they certify our residency for uh, any like the last thing that you shared, uh, it was uh, for the international graduates. So is it hmm. still mandatory for us that we give USMLE to us, so then we will be allowed for surgical fellowship? Or in that pathway, that, uh, there is no such requirement? Is there anything else or not? Okay, so the thing is, these are very, very technical questions, right? Uh, technical questions require a technical answer. So at the end of the day, uh, your specific case, uh, you will have to email them to say, okay, okay uh, this is my eligibility and am I eligible for your program? Am I eligible for your program? And there are lots of, like, you know, answers to this question, lots of loopholes as well. Um, and, but again, quite a lot of things are possible. And Sorry, sorry, I thought you were finished. Um, for example, you said that uh, this, this YouTube video, it shows that if someone is a highly competent faculty, they can join an institute without USMLEs, right? So a highly competent faculty, for example, in Moorfields, it's a you know, high-level institute in the UK. Someone from there wants to go to the US to give a lecture, to do a few guest clinics. Obviously, they will, they will accommodate him. Some someone in that high level, they will not require them to give USMLEs. So at that level, at the faculty level, yes, people go there for teaching purposes, for clinical purposes. That's a whole other different criteria. But then at our level, uh, usually they want with USMLE and clinical fellowships. If no USMLE, then mostly research fellowships. 